What's happening, guys? This is Adi again with Gate 7 International, and we are coming in with our third deep dive of the summer. So things are not moving like they were in the past couple of summers, which has given me a nice little break, but the signings are coming. They're very exciting, and we are really excited to see what's going on and how the team is going to be building coming this coming season. So we're going to be talking about uh, Lorenzo Pirola, the new center back, 22 years old, left footed, by the way, coming in six foot one, 185 centimeters, 77 kilograms, which is about 169 pounds uh, for those of you guys that are um, uh, on the U.S. side of things. So third scouting report we're going to do and it's the first one so far of the summer that is not a center midfielder. The first two scouting reports we did were Denny Garcia and Marco Staminich, both of which are, are center mids. So we're going to be reviewing a different position than the first two scouting reports. And it is a player that was a really abrupt find by our scouting department, uh, especially to grab an Italian player. Um, fun fact for you guys, Lorenzo Pirola is the fifth Italian player ever to sign for Olympiacos. The last Italian player that we signed was goalkeeper Nicolas Leali from Juventus that we signed back in 2016. So fun little piece of uh, trivia for you guys with regards to Italian players. So the first player from Italy we signed in about eight years. Incredible stuff. Now, the profile of Lorenzo Pirola is pretty reminiscent of something traditional that maybe you would have expected from a CB and the brand of Italian Catenaccio, as they call it, uh, especially back in the day. He's strong, aggressive, relatively no-nonsense with the ball at his feet, and he's also quite athletic and shows above-average agility, can play in a back three or a back four, so in the deep dive, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the profile and then see how it fits with our understanding of what we've seen for Mendelibar's system and his current tactics and what his potential asks could be of the player. So the first thing we do, uh, for those of you that maybe are listening for the first time or maybe this is you've only listened to a couple of these, you would have seen these before. We're going to start with a uh, one of our charts here. This is percentile data that we use to measure a player and how they rank in their league. So every data point that you see here is measured not just on the actual data point, which you can see to the right of each one of the individual red bars, but then the length of the bar is dictated by how he ranks compared to other center backs in each one of those statistical categories. And we're going to start off as we always do with goal threat. And as I've said before in, in, in scouting reports that I've done on defenders, especially center backs in the past, we don't spend much time here on goal threat. We're not signing this guy because he's a goal machine. Uh, even if he does have his uses on set pieces, um, we're, we're signing this player because he's a, a defender and, and we need it. Now, he is taller. He's got a, a profile for that is going to be useful for us on set pieces. Every goal that he scored came off of a header from a corner kick. That was the context for almost every single one. The one or two goals that he did not score off a corner came from a different set piece um, that wasn't a corner kick. And... I think the only goal that I saw that didn't come from a header was a quick volley or like basically um, to, to go into the goal. Otherwise, he was scoring only headers. Now, the specific context of how he scored came from him lining up usually on the far side of where of the goal from where the penalty or from where the corner was being taken. And he wasn't always even really close to the goal, maybe six to eight meters out. And he would catch the header from, from there and usually had some nice power on those headers and was, and was hitting them into the, uh, to the far side, usually where the goalkeeper wasn't great arcs on the, the shots from the headers also. 
and they would go in. Outside of those corner kicks and other set pieces, like shot opportunities that he would get in in open play were from hopeful distances and you know, kind of like shots where you're you're never going to really score, but you take a chance. And also really bad angles, usually on the right side. So at the end of the day, really, this guy's going to be a target for us on set pieces. Maybe he'll score, you know, a handful of goals in the season if we're lucky. But, you know, we're not signing this guy because we believe he's going to be a goal scoring machine. And you look at the data here. He does get a, a compared to other center backs, a, a fairly decent number of goal scoring opportunities. So, again, I'm not going to be surprised if we get a handful of goals from him off of set pieces this season. Um, but again, uh, don't hang your hat on that. As far as assist creation, there's really nothing to speak of. Again, not that this is anything negative against the player. He's a center back, so we're we're not super concerned about this. Um, we're, he just doesn't have a lot of offensive end product uh, outside of him being a target for set pieces. So as long as he's going to be functional on set pieces, we're going to be quite happy. And, and, and that's really it, uh, regardless of whether he's going to help us create shot opportunities in any other aspect. So, um, in, in regards to goal creation, nothing there, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there's anything negative on the player in that regard. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is his buildup and possession characteristics. And in possession, Lorenzo Birola was never, at least in any tape that I was watching, he never appeared to be a figure like a Panos Ratzos. Uh, Panos Ratzos, as we all know, he carries the ball forward very much is a modern center back and how he gets involved progressing the ball forward and 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 moving things around. Pirola is not in the same regard as as a player like Panos Ratzos or any other ball carrying center back. And it's not that he does not have the technical ability to do so. He actually has a pretty nice touch, but I just rarely ever saw him taking ownership of the ball and and really getting the ball forward or immersing himself in his team's possession. We we see this as we look at his possession statistics as well. It's in that top third of the chart there. He 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 just doesn't have a lot of volume. And it's he, the, his possession data is very very average on just all accounts or below average. And that's because when he gets the ball, he's taking maybe one or two touches, and then he's distributing the ball either wide or to whatever's right in front of him uh, near the center of the park. Doesn't really use a lot of long balls. His passing range is probably, you know, in that five to 10 meter area. And that's close to 99% of the balls that he's playing is like right there. So he plays what's in front of him, doesn't take too many risks. Um, you know, maybe <laughs> one player I kind of thought of while watching was kind of like Dasos Pados, you know, a guy that didn't take too many risks, just knew what he was good at. And that was kind of it. So, um, it, you know, a very loose comparison, at least now, part of me believes that, that this, that the way we saw, I saw him playing had to be instruction or, and, or relevant to game contact with Salernitana because Salernitana, for those of you that don't watch Serie A. They, they, you know, relegation team had the highest expected goals against, the most shots against, and they were the fourth highest in terms of ball losses as a team in Serie A. So, when you are facing that much pressure, you're a smaller side. You're facing that much pressure on the defensive side of things. It would make sense that as a younger defender, your instructions would be to be a little bit more risk averse, get the ball out of the defensive third as fast as you can. Don't hold it too long. And, 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 and that's kind of where I see maybe why he was like that. When, when you get the ball, you're, you're, you're moving it quickly as a defensive end on the defensive side of things. When you're this young player, you, as a coach, you don't want to put him in these bad situations, especially if he's if he's younger. Also, you're just really trying to clear the ball and, and save yourself from some of that pressure. So when he's at Olympiacos in a team that is going to be in a much more possession-dominant capacity, I see him afforded more space and flexibility to get the ball in this regard. It's not necessarily going to mean he'll become a ball-playing center back, 
but you will see him a little bit more functional and build up, maybe get a little bit more involved in build up and have a little bit more touches on the ball, uh, at least in that regard. Now, if we're looking at his pass accuracy, as, as we see here, it's usually in the high 80th percentile, which for Serie A is, is about average uh, among center backs. N now, because his passing volume is very low, one or two mistakes will have much more impact negatively on him than if he was in like that 50 to 60 passes per match volume area. So as I mentioned earlier, he's not moving the ball great distances, whether he's passing or carrying the ball. And if he needs to dribble out of trouble, it's usually a quick move to the side, and then maybe he'll move the ball to whoever's right in front of him after he gets some space. But he's not he's not going to do much else beyond that long balls. He's not super accurate also. And maybe that's a reason why he keeps things uh, manageable in shorter distances outside of maybe the coach's direction. Maybe that's a reason why he personally doesn't do it. It could be, it could be a little bit of both, but in build up at when Salernitano was dealing with a high press, he could get overwhelmed at times uh, especially if he was getting doubled down in like a high press situation. As long as he had an outlet, he was fine. He would be calm and he'd move the ball. If he was isolated and had to dribble his way out, there could be some trouble. I saw a handful of times uh, if he received the ball under pressure, he panic, maybe lose the ball or make a mistake trying to like settle the ball or get control of the ball if he didn't already have it. Um, I would like to point out, though, that it, these weren't exactly common occurrences. So they weren't happening all the time, but they did happen enough to where you, you would notice it because there was a pattern. So all in all, these are things that I would expect to see in a younger player when a younger defenders kind of thrown to the wolves, especially in a relegation side that's getting hammered offensively. The, the reality is we will probably end up seeing a higher number of mistakes, especially from a, a smaller a smaller side like this and a younger player uh, like Lorenzo Pirola. Now, looking at his defensive attributes, while the possession and offensive area of his game is not exactly amazing, the defensive attributes of the player are exactly why Olympiacos is bringing this player in. Lorenzo Pilola is strong, aggressive, and reminiscent of traditional stalwart defenders that Serie A is known for. He has well above average success in closing players down with the ball and is very astute at reading the pass and the opponent's final third attacking phases. He throws his body also in front of shots to keep them from getting to the goal. I mean, he led Serie A in block shots per 90, which is an impressive feat, especially for Serie A. It's a top three league. So for a guy like him to be leading in that respect, I mean, it's it's pretty impressive. And it it's not like it's not like he Sure, Salernitana had a lot of shots against them, as I mentioned to you guys before, the most in Serie A, but he was in a back three. He was in a back three with multiple center backs, and and he was still taking ownership of all of that and, and really getting his body in front of the ball. So it's just very impressive. Added to that, he's got great timing when he is running players down and committing to sticking in for, for the ball. I mean, it was really interesting to watch. He more often than not would get the ball and, and not miss. And it's, I, th I found that to be pretty fascinating for, especially for a younger player. He's also not beyond using his hands to cleverly dispossess a, a player, get very physical. It does see him draw a number of fouls. He had one of the higher number of fouls drawn um, in, in Serie A, that's for sure. But even among center backs, um, now, he doesn't always usually mark up very tight to a player either, which I found to be interesting. Not surprising, but interesting. He gives himself a little bit of space, usually a step or two. You see that a lot, especially with younger players. They, it, It's a little bit more of a risk-averse positioning tactic just to make sure that you keep somebody in front of you, and if they react, you have, you give yourself some some time to react to what they're, what they're doing. At Salernitana, he played a lot in that back three system that I brought up before with three center backs. So he did tend to have plenty of cover, especially if he wanted to commit forward more or be a little bit more aggressive in trying to dispossess somebody. Uh, 
So he had that cover kind of no matter where on the pitch he was. At Libyakos, he probably won't have that same defensive cover because we'll be playing in a back four. Our wing backs will generally be pushed forward more. I would see that he would be the one actually that would probably have to provide cover for a player like Retzos uh, as Retzos would get forward. So um, that's kind of how I see the context working out, especially with regards to a player like this. Now, I'd be remiss if I did not bring up this guy's physicality. I mean, Pirola is, he's not even that big of a physical presence as I brought up before, six foot one. He's not that big or big body, not that, not that huge of a person, but when you watch him play and see how he's throwing his weight around, I mean, it's, it's pretty remarkable. A uh, very, very, very useful profile to have, especially for, for a defender. In the air, again, Pirola is surprisingly good and commanding despite not being really the biggest center back that you've seen. His athleticism, again, is at work. I mean, he gets great height when he when he jumps to get his head on, on corners, both offensively and defensively. He's one of the best aerial duelers in City Eyes. You can see on the chart here, very few lost duel, aerial duels, especially in his own penalty area. He wins many of them just because of his high vertical and also because physically he'll gain the upper hand positionally against his opponent. And then, you know, before jumping on to get to jumping, to get the ball from a set piece at times, he can get a little over aggressive, especially when jumping for, for the ball, uh, he'll miss time his jump or maybe overcommit. And that can then lead to some danger on, on kind of the back end of things. Maybe this is a function of lack of experience over aggressive intent, Either way, long term, I see this as something that he can fix without too many issues, especially the the more game time that he gets. So at this point now, we move on to the player comparison. And I had a lot of you talking to me about player comparison here. The, the, the comments, the messages, please compare him to Carmo. Uh, please compare him to Carmo. And I thought about it. And... In the end, I did choose David Carmo for a couple of reasons, not just because people had asked me to compare him to him, but I could have picked a center back that was less capable to really kind of show that this player is ha has value in our depth chart. I could have put him against Andreas Doi, who's like, you know, the, the fourth choice uh, center back and third, fourth choice center back, depending on how you look at it. But I was definitely more curious about how he matched up to Carmo and how his profile matched up to Carmo overall, even if it wasn't super, you couldn't compare them as much. But as we look at the radar chart here, the important points here are that we see how close he is to the defensive attributes of Carmo. Just like David Carmo, he's a great shot blocker. And then he throws his body in front of everything that he can in the penalty area. Carmo had the highest volume of block shots per 90 in Greece, just like Pirola was in Italy. I didn't even realize this about Carmo until I was pulling the data. So that kind of caught me by surprise. Now, Carmo was also absurd for us in the air. I mean, you look, he's got, he had an 80% aerial duel success rate. Um, but the overall volume of aerial duel wins by, by Pirola was, was quite high. Uh, actually a little bit higher that you can see there. So in um, Pirola was sitting in that, that just over the 60th percentile in Italy, which was very good. And um, so we see right there, like, you know, okay, if Karma was much more dominant in the air, but Pirola has some, some solid attributes, as I had remarked on earlier, in terms of his aerial ability. Where Pirola outshines Carmo defensively is in the defensive duels or the ground duels, if you will. So very it, closing players down is another way we could put that. And after looking back at some tape, Carmo had some struggles, especially in the Greek league, in the playoffs in particular, when we were he had to close players down. There were a lot of situations where Carmo would get opened up or or beaten past him. And and Pirola, in this respect, was was slightly slightly better if, from a numbers perspective. But when we consider the talent that is in Italy, especially offensively, it's much 
more remarkable that Birola could do what he did against better players than than Carmo, who was playing against the the you know the talent in the Greek league. Now, some would argue that okay, he did. Karma looked much better in the European matches. He didn't care as much about the Greek league, and there is, there is some truth to that. There, there is an argument to be had there. But Pirolo was playing against, on average, better, better quality players overall, and had better data to back it up. So, in that respect, I see that as a a very big positive for a player like Lorenzo Pirola. Now. Gar- Carmo, if we're if we're switching gears here and looking at offense, David Carmo has a leg up on Birola in almost every single offensive category. Now, like I said earlier, while I believe Birola will see higher volume in a lot of these categories because he'll be in Greece and on a possession dominant team, I don't think that's going to see him just become a, a ball playing center back. At least not in the same manner that it was for David Carmo. Carmo last season was a more complete player than Bidola is currently. That's just a fact. And it's also the reason Carmo's price tag is four to five times higher than Pidola's. It's just how it is. And we have to be honest with ourselves here, guys. David Carmo was always a long shot and a player that Greece does not usually see. For a fraction of the price, we found a guy in Lorenzo Pirola who matches up quite well with the defensive capabilities as Carmo, even if he doesn't have the offensive capabilities. So th- there's just a lot of context we need to consider regarding what we can get and at the same time regarding what is useful for the team. So Let's talk about the verdict, what my verdict is on the player. You've seen the data. We've gone through a lot of the context, what was in the film. So what is the outlook on the player? And as I begin to give you the verdict, I want to elaborate on this last point that I just made regarding context and what we need to consider regarding the player. I've said multiple times already that I just don't see him being a ball-playing center back for us. The probability of that, I think, is is very low. Even if his possession volume increases for us, I just don't see that. I just don't see that happening. The player is a more traditional defensive center back, and that's fine. It's fine as that will complement a ball playing center back like Banos Retzos. What we really need in this in the current setup is we need a complement to Banos Retzos. Banos Retzos is more than likely going to be this, the captain this season, whether you like it or not. We need a good compliment for him because he is going to be part of the person that's probably on the field the most. Carmo became a great compliment and partner to Banos Retzos because he was very good in the air, solid with the ball at his feet, could cover Retzos, and provided that stalwart presence that Banos Retzos needed to especially towards the end of the season really really bloom and become the player that we all remembered when he was first before he first left for Bayer Leverkusen. Birola can cover for Retzos and help with the dirty work while still feeding the ball back into Retzos. So given that we can't obtain a profile like David Carmo for an affordable price, what is an affordable price, not just for Libyakos, but for the Greek league, I think Birola represents a great option with future potential. His floor may be lower than David Carmo right now, but the ceiling is pretty high with regards to his ability. And I am, of course, referring to his defensive ability. So as things stand, I don't think... Pirola would be the starter anyway right away. I mean, it seems like Banos Retzos and Nelson Abbey are are destined to be the starting duo for Libyakos, while Pirola is probably fighting for a spot and is going to be third choice. I could see down the line Pirola getting more minutes, and as time wears on, if there's an injury sustained by one of the starters, that maybe he kind of gets that opportunity to shine. That being said, I think this player is a great investment for the club, and I always give one of these thumbs up. I'm giving this signing a two thumbs up because I I see a player here that at the very least is a good complement to Retzos with long-term outlook and value potential. These are the types of purchases that I want to see this club make. 
not older veteran mercenaries because we're always trying to plug a hole here and there. This move shows me that there is a, a long-term outlook on building by the club. Uh, not just building on last year's foundation, but but something that provides us a long-term value potential. And it sounds like the club may still be looking for that veteran presence uh, for center back, a more veteran presence. The defensive signings I don't think are done yet. Um, so there's still going to be more that we're looking to, and then we'll be evaluating the signing, of course, as more signings continue to happen. But Overall, I'm happy with this. Even if this player is a more traditional center back, that is not a bad thing. We don't need every single one of our center backs to be a ball-playing center back. We need them to be functional, and we do need to have somebody that is a, a great complement to a ball-playing center back and somebody that's going to bring us back that aerial presence we're going to be missing with David Carmo. And I think that we have found at about as good of a product as we can get and afford in a player like Renzo Pirolo. So guys, I think that I, well, I should say, I hope that you enjoyed this deep dive. I hope you learned a little bit more about our new center back. Most importantly, many of you guys expressed concern about the signing, given that Carmo, of course, is not returning. And Carmo was, was such an important piece of our, of our European title run this past season. Once again, I'm going to reiterate that a player like David Carmo does not usually come to Greece. That player is too expensive. We had special circumstances working in our favor to pull that off. Pirola is an affordable player with great value potential that will complement a ball-playing center back perfectly. So while he might not have the same impact as David Carmo, he will surely have an impact at Libyakos, that is that is a hundred percent clear. So, I hope you guys enjoyed the scouting report. Like I said, more stuff's coming. More scouting reports are coming. This club is not done yet, and a lot of business is going to happen in August. And I'm sure I'll be kept very busy. So, until next time, guys. This is Gate Seven National by the fans for the fans. You have a good one.